This past year, I attended the bat mitzvah of a relative. She gave her speech about the portion of the week, and after recounting the Bible narrative, she commented, but on a deeper level, this 12-year-old girl then proceeded to expound on what she understood to be the deeper meanings of the biblical tale. I heard this and thought to myself, and people wonder why so many Jews become psychoanalysts. <laughs> An essence of our psychoanalytic work is to be open to and to invite others to be interested in significant deeper meanings in what appear to be simply common sense phenomena. Said succinctly, the Freudian essence is to emancipate one's curiosity about our own deeper level. This is the similarity between Jewish thought and psychoanalysis, to always consider the deeper levels of meaning. In the 1500s, there lived a man in Prague considered by many to be the greatest Jewish scholar, Judah Loeb ben Bezalel, more commonly known as the Maharal. He has been credited with the legend of the Golem. One of his great contributions was to emphasize the metaphoric meaning that lay underneath the easily available surface. He wrote, quote, the vast majority of the words of the sages are meant in a metaphorical and allegorical way. Therefore, don't be alarmed when you see words which appear foolish and distant from wisdom. They are really hidden messages which are very profound and intelligent, close quote. All of us teachers of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis in our own times have said just this to our students. Don't be distracted and misled by the surface. There's more meaning to be gleaned. This is the essential similarity between the psychoanalytic and Judaic worldviews. Our joint appreciation of the existence of latent meanings next introduces the question, of how do we know the accuracy of our suppositions about these latent meanings? Here, the two worldviews separate. In Talmudic study, the suppositions about the deeper levels are confirmed by their affiliation with the thinking of prior revered sages and ultimately by their connection to the Torah. In contrast, psychoanalytic hypotheses about deeper meanings are either supported or not by here and now affective deepening in a patient's experience. A relatively new patient arrives for his session five minutes late. He proceeds to apologize repeatedly and painfully for this presumed transgression. The analyst could remain on the surface and simply be nice to the patient by reassuring him that it's really no big deal and that he shouldn't be so hard on himself. Alternatively, interested in deeper meaning, the analyst could invite the patient to be curious about his need to so deferentially present himself to the analyst. The patient then could respond by noting that many others in his life have also pointed out this very character trait to him, and he has noted his inability to stop being so self-effacing, even when he realizes it's unnecessary. In fact, he notes that this tendency has impacted his ability to take initiative both at work and towards his girlfriend with whom he is struggling to be intimate. These responses from the patient suggest to the analyst that his suppositions are meaningful in the work with the patient, that this patient's excessive apologizing contained deeper meanings was confirmed by his affective associations to the insight. Going to a deeper level, the analyst could consider inviting the patient to be interested in the fact that he likely knew that the traffic is congested at this hour, and as they've discussed in the past, he could have arranged to leave five minutes earlier. The patient may very well respond by noting that he himself did wonder about his choosing to work up to the very last minute, and wasn't surprised that he ended up being late. It suddenly brought to his mind a recollection of an unspoken and presumed to be unspeakable, annoyance that he felt toward the therapist for not being more accommodating to his schedule. The point here is that in psychoanalytic work, the deeper layers of meaning that the analyst supposes exist within a patient 
are only confirmed by their emergence in the patient's experience. This deepening of experience allows an individual to become safely familiar with awkward aspects of themselves, especially those that are shame-filled and guilty, and guilty feelings. When properly done, underlying levels of meaning are not derived from generic theory, but through individual experience. We've noted the similarities. Both systems of thought attend to their own versions of deeper meaning. That there are differences between the rabbinic and psychoanalytic worldviews is quite understandable. For one, they each emerge from mindsets separated by 1,500 years. For another, psychoanalysis is a clinical enterprise devoted to uncovering obscured aspects of our minds and personalities in order to free us from repetitive and gratuitous psychic pain. Talmud study, and we will learn a great deal more about this tonight from our speaker, is for many in order to deepen one's exposure to the thinking of those seen as great sages, which is felt as giving access to the divine. Finally, the Talmud is based on this notion of the divine, which is seen as informing the truth of its suppositions. In contrast, psychoanalysis invites the individual to develop curiosity about their own unique meanings to them of their deity. I want to tell you a little vignette that demonstrates the point of the similarities and differences in these worldviews. I set out to try to describe a traditional Talmud scholar's understanding and the nature of their devotion to Talmud study. And I came up with a sentence that I originally wrote. And what I said was, Talmud study is for many in order to deepen one's exposure to the thinking of those seen as great sages and thereby better approach the divine. That was my understanding of a traditional Talmud scholar. But just to be sure, I sent that sentence off to someone I know who is a devoted traditional Talmud scholar. And I said, does this accurately represent uh, your relationship to Talmud study? And he wrote me back and he said, the issue with the statement about gaining exposure to the sages is that it implies that there is a two-step process, that they are one step removed from the divine wisdom. We would say it in a way that studying their words is studying the divine wisdom. So in true Talmudic form, uh, they suggested that I take out the term thereby so, and make it a one-step process, which of course I did. And I appreciated the precision of their words, but it doesn't end there. The next day, I received uh, another email from the same person, and he said, I just want to make one thing clear, though. And this was said in capitals. He said, I want, you, I want you to be clear that I'm not suggesting that the sages themselves are divine. So the similarity was that the precision of the word, analysts are very precise or try to be about the words they say to their patient just to make the right meaning. And that we shared. But then it went somewhere else. Then what he said is, you have to be careful about what you say and think, because it can cross a line. And that's where the difference between the two worldviews is. The psychoanalytic model says, let's know everything about you. Let's know every thought, imagining, fantasy, fear, shame, grandiosity, whatever it is you feel is most off-putting, let's, let's discover the freedom to say it. Not do it, say it. Uh, and, and Freud built on top of this. He actually borrowed from a second century Roman playwright by the name of Terentius. And he coined the phrase, let nothing that is human be alien. And that's the essence of psychoanalysis. Nothing that is human should be alien. Now that is in contrast to another source of cultural wisdom, the New Yorker cartoons. And the opposite of let nothing that is human be alien, there's a, a well-known New Yorker cartoon of a couple of years ago where a patient is lying on an analyst couch with the analyst behind him. And the patient says, frankly, I don't think my intimate feelings are any of my business. <laughs> <clears throat> to return to our patient, 
There are times in the clinical situation with some patients where an analyst would choose to stay on the surface and straightforwardly offer reassurance. This is similar to what Rav Kahana, who was born in the year 250, said in the Talmud Tractate Shabbat, quote, when I was 18 years old, I had learned the entire Talmud, but I did not know until now that a verse never departs entirely from its surface meaning. Said more colloquially, 1,500 years later, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Nowhere better is the similarity and differences between these two worldviews more evident than in their respective approach to dreams. Quote, a dream that is not interpreted is like a letter that is not read. This appreciation of the ambiguities, wordplay, and hidden memories within dreams is the essence of Freud's masterpiece on dreams written in the 1890s. I was startled to learn that the letter not read sentence was not written by Freud, but in fact was written by Rav Hista, who was born in the year 228 and it was published in Tractate Brachot of the Talmud. Tonight, we will be focusing on this Talmudic period of thought. Freud was very aware of the earlier biblical tradition of dream interpretation and saw his work as an evolutionary extension of it. Though he expressed partiality to the Greek way of thinking about dreams, he nevertheless identified in his own dreams, he identified himself through the image of Joseph, the dream interpreter. Again, both the biblical and psychoanalytic models consider the hidden meanings that lie within dreams. The biblical system, from around 580 BC, sees the interpretation of dreams as portents of the future. It is the interpreter, rather than the dream itself, that is considered to be the carrier of the divinely inspired prophetic ability. In contrast, Freud discovered that dreams contain personal meanings. Each dream carries the disguised fingerprint of an individual's unconscious fears and wishes as shaped over the course of their lives. They illuminate that past rather than foretell the future. In place of their functioning as a vehicle for divinely inspired prophecies, as in the biblical period, or formulaic symbols, as in the Talmudic period, Psychoanalysis sees the dream as an effort of the deepest part of our individual souls to be heard. Rav Chista and the Dorshe Rishumot, those scholars from the Talmudic period who were interpreters of symbols, and the later Maharal, all long antedated Freud. Despite the differences, they shared with him his essential view of dreams, which distinguished them from those who saw dreams as meaningless productions of the brain. Freud summarized, quote, in short, what according to the opinion of other authors is supposed to be merely an arbitrary improvisation hurriedly brought together in the embarrassment of the moment, this we treat as a holy text. That's Freud. There is a bit of prophecy, if you will, in our Jewish past that predicts Freud's discoveries. It is not only Joseph who served as the biblical dream interpreter, but also Daniel. He, in contrast, didn't limit his awareness about dreams to just predicting the future. In response to King Nebuchadnezzar, who asked him to interpret his dream, Daniel said that God gave the dream to him because, quote, he wants you to understand what is in your heart. This idea of Daniel's, that dreams are in fact personal revelations, set the stage for Freud two millennia later. Perhaps this overlap between Jewish and psychoanalytic thinking is best and most simply described by Harold Bloom when he concluded, quote, Freud's most Jewish quality was his deep conviction that there is sense in everything and that such meaning could be brought up to the light. He read the unconscious as Judaic exegesis reads the Hebrew Bible with every nuance every omission being made to show an extraordinary wealth of significance. To conclude giving Freud the final word, you know, he was uh, half humorously in his lifetime called the great Rebbe Freud. Uh, Freud, of course, invented the term psychoanalysis, but as we're learning more and more, much of what Freud wrote in the German is mistranslated into the English, 
and the word psychoanalysis is included in that. We Americans uh, understand psychoanalysis to be analysis, the scientific study of the psyche, the mind, the psychology. That's actually an incorrect translation. Uh, in the German, analysis is indeed the scientific study from, of. But the psyche in German comes from the Greek word psyche, which refers to the soul. Freud discovered a process of scientifically studying one's soul. And here we are tonight. Uh, our format tonight will be both similar and different to years past. After the introduction, uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Calderon from Israel, will step up here and say a number of words. And then uh, we will both, she and I, sit at the table. I will read the story aloud in English that everybody has a copy of. We'll read it together. And then she and I will have an extemporaneous conversation about that story from our two different perspectives. And after which we would be delighted to have comments and questions from the audience. And this is the time where I ordinarily would introduce the speaker. It's going to be another little difference tonight. I first met Ruth Calderon through my brother, Larry Schwartz. And I thought it would only be fitting if he made the introduction. My brother Larry is from New York. He is a retired businessman, a philanthropist, something of a Jewish scholar himself. He is active on the board of Romamu, an important progressive synagogue in the Upper West Side. And he is the uh, founding chair of the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, an important organization that introduces mindfulness and spirituality to, for Jewish leaders around the country. With great pleasure. Larry? Hi, what a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I really want to thank my brother Harvey for asking me to introduce my teacher and good friend, Ruth Calderon. It's a special moment for me to be able to share in Harvey's life work and passion and to be able to contribute a little bit from my own work and passion as well. Ruth received her doctorate in Talmud from Hebrew University and is a renowned teacher of Talmud. Her teaching of a page of Talmud in the Israeli parliament when she was elected a member of Knesset was an important moment in Israeli and Jewish history. If you have not seen the video or re read her speech, I heartily recommend it. It's easily available on Google. Ruth has spent her life trying to make Jewish texts available and accessible to a broad audience. She began many years when Ruth founded and directed Elul Beit Midrash in Jerusalem, the first Beit Midrash of its kind, which taught not only men and women, but secular um, Israelis as well as religious Israelis, a real groundbreaking moment. Um, then when Ruth founded Alma, the home for Hebrew culture in Tel Aviv, where she was the director for 18 years. Ruth is now continuing her work as the head of the culture and education department at the National Library of Israel. I was privileged to be a beneficiary of her teaching, talent, and wisdom when I was really so fortunate and blessed to study with Ruth one-on-one -on -one for two years when she was here in the States some years ago. Ruth broadened my understanding of what it meant to study Talmud. I had previously studied Talmud in an Orthodox day school and a JTS. Ruth opened my eyes to the various possibilities the text offered from a cultural and spiritual perspective. Ruth introduced me to the notion of Hebrew culture its significance and the opportunities it presents for the Jewish people. Most importantly, even though Ruth identified herself as Chiluni, secular, she was one of the most spiritual Talmud teachers I had ever encountered. When we are wondering about the future of Jewish religion, culture, and spiritual heritage, we should not forget to look to the so-called Chilunim, the secularist that who Ruth and others are teaching in Israel 
by the tens and hundreds of thousands. They offer tremendous vitality, creativity, and promise for the flourishing so many desire of the Jewish people, culture, and heritage. And you will um, witness some of, uh, of that wisdom and that teaching and that learning and that accessibility to a, a wide audience tonight. To quote from Ruth's speech in the Knesset, the time has come to reappropriate what is ours, to delight in the cultural, and I would add spiritual, riches that wait for us, our eyes, our imaginations, and our creativity. Tonight's conversation with my brother and Ruth will be an example of that kind of delight. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Fowler. Try this one. I was afraid of uh, making noise. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much. I'm a third child. I have two big brothers, and they kind of uh, framed my life and my world when I was little. And I feel now <laughs> I'm back home with two big brothers. Um, so, where should I start? Before we start discussing the story together, a few words about myself and about how do I um, meet Talmud text and what do I do with it when it's uh, sometimes challenging. And it is connected to the fact that I am uh, a, a girl after two boys in a Sephardic family. My mother was Ashkenazi, but my father was dominant. And the house was kind of Sephardic, uh, somewhat, somewhat chauvinist, um, in a very warm and kind of loving way. But my mother did all the work, and they were lovingly sitting in the living room. And one day when she said to me, suddenly, come help me with the dishes, I understood, I, I became a feminist. Because until that day, everything sounded perfect, because I was not in the working uh, uh, people, but uh, sitting one. And once I did, I started being very, uh, started recognizing and being very aware of uh, what it is to be a Jewish woman in, in our home, in a Sephardic, secular Jewish uh, home. And one of the things that I don't even know how to put my finger when it started and why, but I was a child, I was 11 or 12. And I was and am part of the secular, at that time, majority of, Israel, of Israeli Jews. So we did not visit the synagogue almost ever. I still feel very um, moved to be standing here and close to the big mic, like a very big deal. If I would walk into a synagogue, I would sit upstairs and very far away. So. Thank you again for that and for the hospitality of this beautiful place that uh, I've been here once and I remember it very fondly. Thank you. Um, at some point, I felt that the Israel, that the education that I was given, which was very good and I'm very appreciative of, but was very much based on a lot of Bible, David Ben Gurion concept of neo-biblical new Zionism. So we were all very biblical, walking the tours, jumping the waterfall, all the names are biblical, speaking Hebrew, walking in the footsteps of the prophets. And I know that for my mother, it was very, very moving. And from uh, King, uh, King David, jumping up to David Ben-Gurion, and the middle, richness, the bookshelf of Mishnah and Talmud and Kabbalah and Hasidism and, and, and the, um, the Siddur, the prayer book, were missing from our education completely. It, was, it belonged to the religious. It wasn't part of the Israeli public school, which is public school in Israel, a Jewish school, 
but it is secular Jewish school and it means you study a lot of Bible and then a lot of Zionism. Now my parents came from Europe, my mother from Germany, my father from Bulgaria, and they didn't speak about God or about Jewishness too much. But like good text, I felt that my mother and my father are a secret that I want to unfold, that although we live together and, and, and I, it looks like I know everything there is to know about them, there is something there that I, that I feel is important and I don't know. And it had to do with something Jewish, some kind of spirituality that was not, was not polite even to talk about it in the surface of secular Israel, because spirituality was something not cool. It was something we don't do. We are practical, suntan, uh, you know, serious uh, warriors or you know, building things. We don't do what Jews used to do in, in the old country. And it was around the Yom Kippur War, the 73 war, I was bat mitzvah, and I felt there's something there that I need. And I started searching for that kind of Jewish spirituality. But whenever I tried to learn, there was always some Orthodox person that tries to re educate me or change me or karevoti or to do some verb to me that will change my way of living, way of thinking from the way I was brought up to something that they felt is more right. But I didn't, I appreciated that. It's usually very good people that do what they believe, but I felt I, I am loyal to the way I was brought up and I don't want to change that or get be far away from my parents. I just want to know what is that depth that they kind of touched on and I don't. What, what, where is it? Where are those books, the black books with the gold on them? Why don't we ever see them? Why did no one open them for me? What is in there that is so secret and they keep it from us? It's one of the best ways to get people interested is to get, you know, like toys. You take it uh, away and put it away when you bring it out, it's uh, fresh again. And I started a journey of looking for a place to study Torah, namely mostly Talmud, uh, without changing to be a man or religious, which was two things that usually kept me from the places that study Torah it was in Israel of the time, only for religious Orthodox men. When I, I, I won't go into the whole story, but being connecting myself to psychoanalysis, in, and uh, which is very it's something is very much thought about today in Israel and very attractive, and I think about a lot. Um, I think what I felt when I walked into the world of study, and someone even said that, is that like we are reading. God's diary and we can look into the thoughts that of the creator of the of the world. And there was something very personal and very kind of intimate about that. And my way of thinking about interpretation, Midrash, which is maybe the main tool of the rabbis of how to work with text that is biblical text and make it relevant and alive for today, my metaphor is that of a kite. When you let a kite fly, and today in Israel it's tragic because kites are now burning fields and this is even a difficult day to, to speak because such tragedies are happening together with such important historic moments and if you want, we'll talk about it afterwards. But the metaphor of a kite in study is that you are holding to the thread, the hook, but you let the kite fly up in the, uh, in the air. The, 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 what do you call it? The string that you hold is the text, the word or the sentence from the Bible, 
and the, the kite that is in the sky is your new creative interpretation that you think about today. If you let go of the string, it will just be paper in the wind and it won't be interpretation, it will fly away. If you don't let it fly high and hold it tight with a string, it won't be a kite, it will not be able to fly. There needs to be tension between holding whatever you want to interpret and the freedom of it going even beyond what you imagined it will go. And that, in my, in my uh, eyes, is good midrash when, when it's very tight. When I walked into the world of study, and there's Bible and Mishnah and Talmud and Kabbalah and Hasidut, each one, I feel, like a radio, is tuned into one of the stations, naturally. And I found that I am tuned, I hear clearly when it is rabbinic writing, when it's Talmud or Mishnah. And when we'll talk about uh, the Talmudic rabbis today, we talk about a small group of uh, thinkers and writers, uh, I see them as artists that live in the 5th century, 4th, 5th century in Babylon, in the four famous yeshivot, Sura, Neardea, Mechoza, and Pompedita. And they are a kind of an elite. I see them like Buddhist monks. They live within themselves and they created a whole series of stories whose aim is to kind of massage their psyche, their soul, and make it awake, make it fresh, like Buddhist stories that, that startle you and you kind of wake up, like someone throwing cold water at, at you. So that is what I believe these stories are doing. They created, starting in the first century, second, third, and fourth, um, until the 5th century when they uh, edited the Babylonian Talmud and finished that era, they begin in, uh, in Israel and they go up to Babylon. They um, invented or created a new revolutionary Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, that changed the way Jews lived and felt and thought about themselves in the temple time. And in, in many ways it was changed instead of Jerusalem as the one pillar of the world, center of the world, um, temple, they have de developed a Judaism that could be uh, happening and worked anywhere in the world. Instead of sacrificing, slaughtering animals, they de developed prayer and study as ways of worshipping. That was a very good uh, time for the cows, the sheep in Israel. Instead of um, the priest who is born to be the ideal type or the prophet in the Bible, they invented the new ideal type which is themselves, the rabbi, the, the scholar, Talmud Chacham. And to be a scholar is a life journey which I'm trying to, to live. And it's a journey that th the thing that you do is you study all the time. You go again and again to the same uh, classic text and you try to, and there's a belief that the text is waiting for you personally and that God hid, like in high tech, uh, that you can hide information, God hid a little note with your name on it in the text and that if you will not come and wait until you find the note and open it and understand it that wisdom will never come to the world so it's responsibility there is a note there with only your name on it and you're the only person that it's a kind of a, a James Bond uh, kind of a mission impossible thing it's yours and it's your responsibility, and it might take years that you look at the same text and it doesn't open to you. And you look at it again and again and again. In the Kabbalah, they say it's like dating a beautiful woman or trying to, to make her uh, appear 
show herself to you and then open herself to you and it's kind of but with Kabbalah it's always erotic but in the rabbinic time it's more about opening the secret and I feel that I feel although I'm not considered religious like religious halachic Jews I do believe that the Torah uh, is a kind of a text that makes it possible for us to still find new meanings that were not understood yet, and maybe that's psycho and, uh, psychoanalysis uh, too. Um, the way they lived, the community, and that's important for the story, is that they, they invented in Babylon the concept of yeshiva, that young men will come, the best young men will be selected from the schools, from the primary schools, and they'll go to a middle school, the best ones will be selected to the yeshiva, the community will pay for their study, because after they will study, they will give back, and they will be the leaders of the community spiritually. So when we have enough uh, young men that were selected, they built the yeshiva, which is in some ways uh, very much like the monastery of that time, young people living alone in, in uh, the Christian uh, monastery. And, and they lived there all together. They were married. In Eretz Israel, you marry and then you start studying. In Babylon, you study and then you come back to marry, or the other way around. In Eretz Israel, you would go home every day. In Babylon, you go away to study for 12 years or 24 years and then come home. So they all had wives. And the wife of the rabbi is a very important piece of the story. They usually don't have names. They're called the wife of Rabbi Akiva, the wife of Rav Kahana, the wife of whatever. But they are aware of the fact, because they write the stories, and the stories are always about them, because they are interested in, in working with their own soul. They are aware of the fact that without a wife, they say a, a man without a, a wife is like is homeless, doesn't have walls, doesn't, doesn't have a ceiling, doesn't, can't live. They don't say it about a woman without a man. Maybe they don't care, maybe they know that she can survive. But a man without a wife cannot, and the wife in Aramaic, the word for wife is home. She's called home. She's home. The home of Avkana, the home of Rabbi Akiva. So there is a wife. She is at home and you go to the yeshiva and you live with your other men colleagues. And then when you become, you get your PhD, you become a rabbi, you go back home and you go on living. Um, there are many stories about the relationship to the wife, but it's like people that commute or that travel to, to work and their wives are at home, it's not easy, it's a distant relationship and they, they have many stories about that. I'm putting that as, on, on stage because today uh, the psychoanal psychoanalyst chose to study one of the uh, stories that is based on that uh, phenomenon. Now just one more thing before we start, as a daughter of a Sephardic father, it was not so rare that my father said things that I couldn't stand, usually about what women are. Or... And I loved him very much. He was an amazing, funny, smart, wonderful man. But I didn't love the, those ideas, especially when they're about him. The same kind of thing happens to me with the Talmud. The Talmud is not feminist and not democratic and not... Uh, Modern, it's, it's a chauvinist, ancient, male-centered uh, Jewish classic text. And when I meet a text that is in a strong way uh, putting women in a place that I would not like to live in in my real life, I stop for a minute and I remember two things. One is that I love my father and even when I don't agree with him, that's my father. I can't change the father. He's part of me, he's my history, he's where I came from. I don't have to say the same things that he used to say, but I own him. He's the father I got. 
And he was a wonderful father. And the same thing I think about Judaism. That's the Judaism. That's where I come from. I can't change, go back and change everything they said to feminism. They were not feminists, but I can be a feminist. The fact that I come from them doesn't mean that I have to think like them. And the other thing, and that's what we're going to do today, what I do when I find a real, like, seriously chauvinist uh, piece of Talmud, is that I stop when I be feel that I'm beginning to be angry or get hurt, and I go backwards and I decide to read it as a man, not as a woman. I read it as a rabbi. I identify in these stories with a rabbi because it is stories that were written by rabbis for rabbis. And if I want my soul to develop, I need to read it as the hero of the story, not as the uh, support uh, actress that is going to get hurt because I'm not a support actress in my life. I am the protagonist. And so I'm inviting you today also, at least as an option, to read the story as the rabbi. This one, this story that Harvey chose is going to be very challenging. And I'm, I'm still uh, excited and wondering what's going to become of them. But what I did here in this book that, uh, that was here and some of you saw, is that I took the, the story or the text and then I told the story that is my kite. I let my imagination go as long as I hold the text and I'm fair to the text. I don't put in the story things that are completely foreign to the text. I let my kite fly high and we will share with you one of those kites and then we'll see what happens to the protagonists when they meet the real Vaikrana. Everybody should have their copy of the story, and I will read it. It's about a 10 minute read, and then uh, Ruth and I will have a conversation. I should have a sofa to lie down. The text from the Talmud is when Rav would visit the city of Darshish, he would announce, who will be mine for a day? And when Rav Nachman would visit the city of Shachnitzir, he would announce, who will be mine for a day? And what follows is Ruth's story. When Rav would visit Darshish once or twice a year, the whole synagogue would get caught up in a frenzy of excitement, and Rav would lock himself up for hours in the study house to settle matters of law that had been left unresolved. On Shabbat, he would come to pray in the synagogue at the top of the hill, which looked, looked out on the whole town and its houses, yards, orchards, and gardens. Through the screen marking off the women's section, I could see him standing before the ark to lead the congregation in prayer. His body was erect, his form splendid in a robe of fine stitching, and his bright forehead unblemished by sun. And all the men clustered around him as if he were a prince. On laundry days among the women, I heard rumors that they were looking for someone to serve as Rob's wife for the duration of his visit to our town. And so when the synagogue beetle sought me out in my backyard four weeks prior to Rob's visit, I knew what he had come to say. He found me with my sleeves rolled up and my hands buried in a basket of laundry, delighting in the pleasant odor of clean clothes and the warm sun that would dry them well. I was not a young woman anymore. Eight years had passed since I had been widowed. At first I let the Beatles stammer in embarrassment about the role they needed me to play and hint at the assistance I would receive from the community and the amount of ketubah money I would be paid if the rabbi should elect to divorce me after the fact. I requested some time to think over the matter and I sent the man on his way. While lying in bed that night, I resolved that I would exceed because of the money and because of what people would always say. Two is better than one. And because it had been years since I had known the feel of a man's caress and the smell of his breath, and I yearned for those days again. The next day, when the beetle returned, I nonetheless gave him a hard time before agreeing to his terms, 
lest I seem overly eager. He conveyed a few strictures that I had to be sure to keep so that I would be ritually pure in advance of the rabbi's visit. His concern that I might begin to bleed as a result of excitement and anticipation seemed rather excessive, if not downright amusing. Nonetheless, I carefully calculated the days of my menstrual cycle as if I were a young bride. They would open the ritual bath especially for me in the darkness of night so that no one would see me. The days raced by. On the eve of the rabbi's arrival, word spread that he had permitted the remarriage of two chained widows, women who had lost their husbands in a recent flood. A wave of grateful approval washed over the community, and even I was enchanted by the news. As the rabbi stood at the head of the synagogue giving his talk, his wandering gaze rested on me for a moment. Along with the rest of the community, I felt drawn to his visage. From my place among the women, I felt as if my morning clothes and kerchief were blushing. A forgotten feeling awoke inside me. I wanted to get closer to him. During the reception that followed his talk, Rob was surrounded by a crowd that sought his blessing and kissed the palms of his great hands. The leaders of the community allowed him a brief respite from the crowds, and on the terrace of the synagogue, amid a great sea of people, I stood there before him. I heard him turn to the surrounding men and ask, who will be my wife for today? Perhaps I didn't exactly hear him say that, but I read his intentions in the curl of his lip, and I knew that I was not the only one who heard the question. Virgins hid their faces, and mothers pulled their curious daughters outside and away. There were already a few women who were known to have spent the night with Rob on one of his previous visits. Two of them had come to the synagogue dressed in full finery, strutting to and fro. One of them even looked Rob in the eye and gave him a knowing smile. He nodded back to her in blessing. I walked toward him with lowered eyes. My feet pattered against the floor to the rhythm of my fluttering heart. I approached no farther than honor would permit. The beetle whispered in his ears. Rob looked in my direction and gestured to me to come closer. A murmur passed over the crowd, and I felt suddenly relieved that my elderly mother had stayed at home. I thought about the chatter of the local kitchen maids who dice up gossip into bite-sized morsels. I feared for my good name as I raised my eyes. Rob's face was luminous and shone only on me. His beetle approached and led me out of the crowd and into a new reality. A door was opened to a side room. Rob disappeared, and the crowd began to slowly to disperse. I stood there as if paralyzed. I heard from a distance the instructions of the beetle in my ears. When it gets dark in the town inn in the great guest room, there his honor will await you. I had become a bride for a moment. Even that old feeling of embarrassment seized me as if I were a virgin. When I rushed home, the sun had already sunk to the height of the trees. I moved about the house silently, washed my face in cold water, dressed in a clean frock, and walked out into the empty streets with wet hair amid the melodies of the evening prayers. The light of the oil lamps dancing in the windows spilled out into the street, which had become my wedding canopy. Rob was immersed in solitary study in the corner of the room. I was greeted by his beetle, a man I found not particularly pleasant. I kept my distance. Suddenly, the rabbi of the town appeared with two witnesses. I stood there as if dreaming, with Rob at my side, my head reaching only to the height of his chest. There was no wedding canopy and no candles, but I heard once again the words of the wedding blessing, who forbids to us and permits to us by means of the canopy and sanctification. The words were spoken like an ordinary prayer, quickly unaccompanied by tears or by smiling parents. Rav said in his stentorian voice, behold, you are sanctified unto me, and handed me a handkerchief from his pocket. I reached out my hand and took it. The rabbi and his attendants checked that the handkerchief had been properly transferred and muttered in approval. Rob said to them, you are my witnesses, and the rabbi concluded, she is sanctified. And then everyone left the room as if they had never been there. Then it was just the two of us, he and I, in the guest room of the town inn. It was our wedding canopy and our bedroom and our house and our whole world for one night. Rob did not mince words and did not try to win me over as young men are wont. He also didn't fall all over me. He just sat by my side. I could see his eyelashes, which were long and straight, as he is. He looked at me with curiosity and with a certain tranquility, and I returned his gaze. 
The look of his face appealed to me even more from up close, and I delighted in him like a young girl. The room in the honor of the man who sat cross-legged beside me seemed to, like, seemed, to, seemed to me like all I would want of heaven. My life, exhausted and well-worn like a paved road, had suddenly led me to a main thoroughfare that I had never expected to traverse. The heads of the community, the luminaries of the generation, and me. Rob began to say a few words about the town, and we sat for an easy hour exchanging pleasantries until I nearly forgot the whole reason that I had entered into this hasty matrimony. Suddenly, he took my hand in his and brought it to his mouth. My breath fluttered, my breath fled, then fluttered and relaxed like a dove. His eyes gazed upon me as if I were a vision. I realized then that I had found favor in his eyes. With the shedding of gowns and scarves, names and roles and titles fell away. He became a man, and I cast off my widowhood and became once again a woman. Our nakedness opened the floodgates of our hearts, and there was nothing to worry about and no reputation to uphold. After all, this man was no villain, and was not the rabbi responsible for it all? His body in its full expanse was mine by right and holy law, and there was no fear that our union was not for the sake of heaven, as our teachers used to warn us about in school. I delighted in the sound of the word, my husband, which served as an invitation and a request and brought back the old sense of being conquered and won. Our bodies did not know if palm would fit to palm, if hip to hip. We had been taught the proper way of touching on this day, but I was not the young bride I had once been, nor was I the woman I had been the day before. And this man was once far and close, as if he were always a part of me, passing through me like a shadow. And I tasted of his goodness, and I smelled him and touched him and felt my own fingers come alive and went into him and took himself into me. And I built up and knocked down and draped myself around him and relished the full surrender that had never been so complete. And my hunger for his breath and for the scent of his body would not be satisfied. And his body was hot and steamy until it reached complete rest. We were splayed across the bed when I opened my eyes, my body full, and I saw that he was looking at me. I'll take you with me, he said. Come home with me, my wife. I smiled, I kissed his forehead, and fell back to sleep. In the morning, he continued to sleep after I had awoken. It is commonly believed that larger bodies require more rest. I woke up and looked at him as if he were a dream that had not vanished with the passage of night. I banished all thoughts of a baby with a face like Rob and all thoughts of following him back to his home. Once again, he did not seem like the great Rav. The form of his body was known to me, like that of a little boy whose fears I dissuaged. I knew what I would do. I put on my frock and I dropped his handkerchief over the bed, drawing its smell once more toward me, and it drifted to the bed wondrously and simply, just like our marriage. That's my mic, but I'm now... Um, what I try to do here is to give voice to the women that usually are silent and to try and tell the story from her side because this text that we are talking about is not even a story, it's a historical uh, note that says that that's what rabbis used to do when they would travel. They would marry someone for the night and then divorce them. And it doesn't sound very, I mean, what were they thinking? And so I thought, one is what were they thinking, but the number two is, wh who, would, who would agree? Why would a woman agree to get married to someone and then be divorced? So I tried to think, why would I ever agree? And, and then, while I was writing it, I thought it could be a nice thing when you go for a conference somewhere. <laughs> you marry someone, you have a weekend, you divorce, and you go back home. So that's my opening. So 
so the challenge that I faced in reading the story is how can I represent a psychoanalytic point of view to the material? And the best way I came up with was to uh, pretend that each one of the characters in this story come to my office for a consultation. And when I read the story, in thinking of Rav, I was reminded of, of an actual patient of many, many years ago, who will be very well disguised. But this was a, a man in his 30s who came to me, and his life, similar to Rav, he traveled the country making presentations. And he was the sort of man that was filled with charisma. And he had many, many followers around the country. Best way to represent it is, if he were in the entertainment industry, you would call these people groupies. And there were large numbers of them wherever he went. Uh, he would finish making a presentation, he would go out in his car, and his car would have a young woman in it. And he partook. And it was during this time that he came to me, and he came to me because he was unhappy with his life. And he would describe these adventures. And over our time in talking about him, he discovered a number of things. One of which was, he said, you know, these women don't really know about me. And even more, they don't seem to care about me at all. And from that he came to recognize that likewise, he neither knew them nor cared about them. The women were interested in him because they got certain excitement about being close to celebrity. And he was interested in them because he had this inordinate need to be adored. And once that became less immediate to him, he discovered something else that was inside himself that was covered over by all this excitement. And that is that he felt terribly lonely. And he got to be able to sit and listen to that loneliness. And what it brought to his mind was his childhood, which he had never thought much about. And it was a childhood that in his mind was uh, represented by a sense of alienation that he felt from his father. And as a result of which, his sense of his own masculinity was very fragile. And so what he had unconsciously designed for himself as a remedy, an attempted remedy, was if he could bed enough women, he would then feel like a real capable man. Needless to say, it doesn't work. And he also had the hope, we learned, that he could show his, man, his father how successful he is, look at all the women I have. That too didn't work. Over time, he indeed was able to marry and settle down and, and, and did quite well. But this is the patient that came to mind when I read about Rob. So, I pictured Rob coming to my office and saying, I'm not happy. Tell me about it. Well, I go from town to town, and people think I'm the bee's knees. They say I'm special, I'm so wise, they, they turn over to me all their personal problems and they ask me for magic solutions, and I provide magic solutions. They seem satisfied, I make a living, and I get people to respect me, which I'm really desperately hungry for why they think I know more about how they should live their lives than they do, I've never been able to figure out. But they seem satisfied with the decisions that I come up with. But it's getting old. Truth be told, I'm no better or different than you, me, or anyone else around. But they, people have a need to put me on a pedestal. And I am feeling, like my patient, unknown and uncared for as, as the real man I want to be. And Doc, now that we're talking about it, there's something else. I can't talk to my wife. Here I am, supposed to be the great Rob, right? I'm terrified of my wife. And what I'm most terrified to talk to her about is how lonely I feel. I'm afraid to tell her that I'm afraid to tell her. I have this idea that she's going to yell at me. 
Yeah, 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 I know. My mother was a yeller. Yeah, that's true. But right now, it's my wife that I'm really scared of. So maybe if you and I talk, I can learn to become not a great man, but a capable man of treating people with dignity and decency, and also wanting to talk to my wife about the, the missing intimacy in our life, the vulnerabilities and the loneliness that I have felt for a long time that I would like us to try to work on. So what do you think? We can do this, Doc? I, I love it that the community is paying for this therapy too. <laughs> the beetle comes and pays the check afterwards. Um, a few things I thought. One is that his name became Rab because, because he was so famous. It's like, it's like Frigidaire. You call, you call the Frigidaire after the, the brand. He is one of the first rabbis and his name is Abba Richa, Abba, like Abba Evan, Abba Richa, and he's a long and beautiful man, but he is so famous that he's called Rav, and as you said, that he's such a celebrity that his personality is smaller than the, the title. That is one. The second thing about the women, I'm thinking that there's something like, like natural or from the animals that a woman responds to an alpha male. If all the, ma all the men respond to him as a leader, there's something like natural to want to have children from him. And maybe that worked. And the other thing is um, that when you talk about a celebrity in something else that gives presentations, the difference is that Rav is a man and Torah. The, 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 the charisma is not only him, but the fact that he is a professional and a knowledgeable and a, someone that owns something that is not his, that is bigger than him. And maybe that is also the fear that when, he, when people adore him, it's not really only him, it's the Torah that he studies. The thing I, I was thinking about a lot, I heard that Persian uh, businessmen do this and still do this to this day. They go to places and they get a wife for the time and then they send her away. And I'm thinking about the loneliness of, uh, of people that are on the road. That when you, you do your show, Everybody thinks that uh, whatever. Then you have to go to the motel and spend the night alone and morning alone. And again, that, those moves between being on stage and being, you know, simple person uh, doing your laundry with the coins is something very tragic or very painful. And so uh, they they had to be. A, desperate in their loneliness in order to go to all this I mean they could go to a prostitute and they, I'm asking the therapist why didn't they just go to a bar or to prostitutes and build this whole organization of getting married it shows up in the next story <laughs> you know when Ruth and I chatted uh, we haven't planned this out, but br spoke briefly about an overview, and uh, our hope was that we were going to disagree, because that could be fun. And I think we just did. Um, when you said, and tell me if I get this right, when you said that uh, he's not only him, but he's a celebrity because he has Torah. Yes. All of us who work in clinical fields have seen people uh, who are powerful people. And they are not one iota less lonely, needy, sad, longing than the poorest of the people we see. That having great knowledge, great wealth, great celebrity, great beauty doesn't spare us. In fact, in some ways it makes it worse because people will project onto us all the things that it means to them 
and they will relate to you through that, and they won't care to know you. They will just care to feel how you shed light on them. And so some of the people I and I'm sure many in the audience have seen, he may, he may be affiliated with Torah. Uh, I don't think that changes his essence as a person, a man, a lonely person, someone who's frightened of his talking to his wife, or someone who's going to be needy as he turns out to be in your story. I would add to that, that because they are rabbis, and he's a rabbi and a head of a yeshiva, He's a moral person. He wants to be moral. He teaches his students that you shouldn't uh, behave to another person as, a, as an object. And now he's going to marry someone in order to not be alone, which is objectifying her. So in order to feel good about himself, he marries her. It's, it's a little... I don't, the fact that it's really working in some worlds is between horrifying and funny, but it is the, the marrying thing is in order to solve his own guilt, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So should we talk about the woman? Yes. yes. Why would she come? Ah. And who pays for her therapy? <laughs> well, she made money on the ketubah, right? right, right yeah. <laughs> So the woman comes to my office and she says, you could tell by how I'm dressed that I'm a widow. And you perhaps can tell by how weary I am that I've been a widow, widow for eight years. But something happened last night. I had a dream. And there's something important in this dream that I'd like to talk to you about because there's something I want to learn from it. See, in this dream, I was the chosen woman. My whole life, I wanted to be a chosen woman. I have two sisters. I was never the chosen. In my dream, I was the chosen one. And I was chosen by a grand, special person. He was lovely. And it, you know how dreams are, and somehow it felt like I went back in time, that I was now a young girl. And being chosen by this man felt like I imagined heaven to be. I even felt like a virgin again. But I guess in my dream, I did feel guilty. Because I had, in the dream, this made up, totally silly marriage ceremony. That must have been because I felt guilty for what I was doing. And not only that, I didn't want my mother there. <laughs> Could you believe it? I'm this age and I'm still uncomfortable with my mother knowing about my sexuality, huh? Go figure. So he and I married for the night and as dreams would have it, it was my dream, it was wonderful lovemaking. I haven't been with a man in forever, but this in the dream was of course perfect. It was like a hand and glove, it was perfectly wonderful. But then you know, Doc, have you heard about, have you ever had dreams within dreams? When you're in a dream and you sort of know you're dreaming, well, that's what happened to me towards the end of this dream. He and I were together in the middle of the night, and I started becoming aware that this was a dream, and it wasn't really the answer to my real life. He asked me to come home with him. Could you believe it? Come home with him? to his other wife. How do you imagine that would work out? But actually, you know, since it was my dream, it was probably my longing and my desperateness that I had him representing. So I was being pulled by a part of me that wanted to stay in this dream being married to this magical man. But enough of me knew that it was just a dream and that there is real life. And I left him, these longings, and this magic behind. And I awoke. But the dream is here to teach me something. And that's why I'm here in your office. Because I learned from this dream that I, I do want passion in my life. I do want a companion, but not a married one, and not somebody who's uh, parading himself like a celebrity. I want her just a regular real person who's available to me, who's interested in me, who I can know and love. And maybe I could use the energy of this dream to help me build that life. Can you help me do that? 
You have a nice profession. <laughs> um, yes, I do. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about this woman, something very kind of down to earth, that women need money and freedom when they're in such a situation, a woman alone in a, in a male dominant society. Um, in the Greek world, if a woman was widowed, she couldn't own anything and she had to go back to her father's or her brother and she would be like a maid or a slave there. In the Jewish community of the rabbis, a woman could own. We know that because Roman matronitot, matronita, like important women from the Roman world would come and live uh, with the Jews because they could have a, a status and money and so on. So what I feel is happening here is very practical and not romantic. She is willing to sleep with this rabbi and even compete for the job, for the be chosen, because she's going to get a, a pensia, a stipend or whatever. And she, and then the option of going back to his home and, and doing laundry with his wife doesn't really uh, appeal to her, although there is, there is something romantic because he is love. And, she, and it, it is thanks to the fact that he says, I want you to come back with him, that you can say, I think if he wouldn't choose her, he would go on not trying to be chosen. But once he did, she said, okay, now I can let go. And, and she's leaving him the transitional object of the handkerchief. So when he wakes up, <laughs> he doesn't cry. Ready for her? Yes. Okay. The surprise yeah. thing. Yeah. You might wonder, so who's the next character to right. walk into the office? And it's the beetle. The beetle comes in and he says, you probably don't know who I am. <laughs> and that's because nobody knows who I am. In fact, nobody who ever heard this story would ever think I'd be a character in it. <laughs> but you know, I'm a person too. And I may be the last one to know that. You see, the reason I'm here, Doc, is that nobody knows who I am. I'm a bit player. I've never been a lead actor, ever. And you know, you Freudians may have something about the, when you say that childhood impacts adulthood, because, you know, when I was a kid, my parents divorced. And all I ever wanted from them is that they get back together. And look what I do for a living. I put people back together. It didn't work with my parents. I don't know how well it's working for now either. But I, I want something else for myself. I don't want to be the bit player. I don't want to be the one who arranges other people's having lives. I want to get my own life. But there are a few problems with that. These women, Doc, I don't understand them at all. Their bodies, their bleeding, and their excitement, it confuses me. I, it, it's just mixed up to me. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know so much about my own body. It's fluids and dreams and, you see, I've never been with a woman. I've been so busy taking care of other people being together, I've never been with a woman. I've never been anything more than a bit player. Check out that woman's dream. I barely appeared in her. <laughs> so I'm here to become a person, to become uh, the protagonist in my own life. What do you think? You can help me do that? You surprised me when you brought up the Beatles because I, I wasn't aware of him and the the Duke, I didn't think he'll get the stage and I honestly can't stand him. You know the, the character of the Macher? Is that a word in English too? You can't do the fixer. The, you can't do anything in Israeli bureaucracy without a fixer, a macher. And they're always... It's never completely clean. It's always... They 
it has to do with money and it's always almost legal and and they come and oh, I'll help you to get it and you want your son to go to this place in the army they, he knows people and he I hate that there's something scary in the way that it's never clear and it's not straight way the Maharim and when they are around uh, strong important people both in politics and in, in the religious world they are like using some of the power but they were not supposed to be given the power so they, they always scare me it's also the the lobbyists in the Knesset you don't exactly know they're not known but they're working for something very they are you know, so that was my feeling, uh, and especially in Israeli Rebbeinu, uh, there are ma a lot of fixes, and, uh, and it, you never know where it will go. There is a beautiful, almost new movie by Yosef Seder, the Israeli uh, filmmaker, about a fixer, uh, but he's, he's quite merciful there uh, to this character and what you did to me here is that you made him a human being which I didn't think I I was busy being afraid of them and didn't think that they also have a place where they want to be people so, thank you. yes please I wonder if you could do the same thing with Rob's wife. With Rob's wife. <laughs> I, I was thinking when, I, when we were talking, is Rav married to Yilta or is that Rava? Does anyone remember the series before? One of the rabbis is married to Yilta, who is the Jewish klafte. She's the Jewish uh, frightening woman. I was wondering if you refer to that. And there are stories about her as yelling and throwing things and frightening Xantipa of the Jews, uh, Greek Xantipa. Um, but it's a very good point that you're making because so many women are at home when husbands are traveling. It's a classic Gint and Solveig and uh, Odysseus and Penelope and Jacob and Rachel. It's the classic uh, Solveig and Per. It's the classic um, old world position of the woman to get home and to imagine what is he up to. <laughs> um, in some ways, I grew up with a mother that is like that because my father was traveling a lot he worked with the UN in developing countries, and it was times when we didn't fly so much. So if he would go, it could be for a few months. And I, I was devastated when he was away, and I felt that my mother is very, it was very difficult. So next time I'll try to give that voice. Maybe it was too hard for me to even... And maybe in another voice, in another, if I go back and go to another road, maybe she feels free and she has the house. Nobody needs their dinner and bringing them the shoes and the this and the that and leaving socks everywhere. And maybe she has a lovely time uh, for the, and she knows that he doesn't, that he can't sleep alone. And she wonders. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> what would you make of her? Just briefly, I did imagine her coming to the office as well. And um, I, I had a, a few different versions. First, I, I imagined her coming saying, I just found out what my husband's been doing on all these conventions. <clears throat> and from there, one can go lots of different places. She could say, I'm done, I want out, I want you to help me separate from this man, one, one way to present. She could come in and say, you know, I've actually realized I've known about it forever, and I don't know what's to be for us, but 
I do have to look at myself because, truth be told, I've been a cold wife in the past year. We haven't been intimate. We haven't been warm with each other. I made it very difficult for him to find a welcome home here. Maybe we can, maybe we can't, but maybe I should take a look at myself too. There are a lot of variants when people come to the office in these kinds of situations. Thank you so much for this great discussion. I want to propose uh, maybe a more Kabbalistic interpretation, and that that's, that erotic knowledge is the basis for divine knowledge, and that the rabbi needs that insight for him to continue in his work, and that the woman understands this, and he, he slips at the end, he thinks a bit that it's actually he's loving her, and she reminds him of his past, which is the propagation and the development of divine knowledge. And she and sex is a vehicle. So that's a kind of a reflection. You're, you're being very generous to this. Can you explain this to me? I didn't. What, what your generous reading of it works together with the fact that they write it in the Talmud. I mean, they could have just not write it and not embarrass us with knowing this. There's something very powerful in the fact that they wrote it in the Talmud and gave it to us to try to understand. And I, I, I really appreciate many places in the Talmud that they write things that are not um, like official pictures. Like they would write about Elisha ben Avuya that is a her heretic. Heretic. They could edit him out, but they don't. And they write that they slept with women and married them. And so that is part of the my love to this culture, that it's not playing as if they're perfect. Can you say? The, Yes, but if that is serious, let him send someone to his wife too, and she will be also uh, growing up in spirituality. There's this gentleman there. I think that the way that we're talking and the frame of reference is all fine, but I really want to know what the heck was actually going on. Does the Gemara talk about it to the extent that we can really, I mean, this is so shocking. Why, in particular, these two guys, Rob and Rob Nachman, do they say elsewhere, oh, well, these were the beautiful guys? What is it that we can deduce to actually know what was going on? And then, if we can at all even get to that point, what can we see about how open they truly were. You're saying they they didn't conceal certain things, but it seems to me a whole lot is always concealed. Are you a psychologist? Because <laughs> everything, a lot is always concealed. What I want to say to you is that I do not usually read these stories as history. I don't know what exactly happened. Uh, many of these uh, narratives are stories, art. But in this case, and I tried to ask Harvey to choose one of the stories, but it shows this piece that I felt there's nothing in it, it's so small. It, and it, I think this is history, it really happened. And I say that because when I was researching my work and for this book, I found that actually it is still happening in Persian culture um, today, in, in business. No, no, not Jewish. In Persian culture as a whole. So I think what happened is that, and, and by the way, they are not the beautiful ones. Rabbi Yochanan is beautiful. Rabbi Abau is beautiful. They are not the, and they, they are not rabbis that have a lot to do with women, especially at all. They're serious rabbis. Rav is a very big 
man, a head of a yeshiva, very well known. He has other stories with the butcher, and he has stories of weaknesses, but not with women. And Rav Nachman also, they are, it's like telling stories about two presidents, serious people. I think what happens, no, serious people, I mean, serious, important, powerful people. I, I must say, after we won't go into politics, I'm, um, what I think happened is that at their time it was done like it was done in Persian culture and they are writing it without even thinking that it will be judged. I think that's the, what happened. And the world has, I mean, some of the things my father did today would be people, you know, we would be spanked if we were bad. The, the, nothing is like, I mean, today... We live in a modern world that everything is so, uh, so changed. But even when it was done, it was interesting to go into the story. Even in a world that thinks it's, uh, it's okay to have two wives, or it's before Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom. He could take her home. And there is an option that there will be a baby. And that baby, I think they did the ceremony because the baby will not be a mamzer. It will have a, not just a, hus a father, but a very prestigious uh, father and good genes. So it even makes sense in a kind of a crazy way. Hi, I'm Rabbi Abe Friedman. I want to just take this opportunity to thank Dr. Ruth Calderon and uh, Harvey Schwartz. This has been a pleasure to have you here again. And uh, this has been our fifth annual Judaism and Psychoanalysis lecture, and I hardly have to tell you they get better every year. <laughs> um, I would thank everyone for coming. Thank you for being here. I want to especially uh, pick up and build off of Dr. Calderon's story of encountering Jewish text, encountering the Beit Midrash, to uh, invite everyone to the Center City Kehillah's Jewish Night of Learning. It is the best 12 hours of Jewish learning all year. Uh, it's going to be this Saturday night, beginning at 7.30 p.m. at Moore College of Art and Design at uh, 19th Street and the Parkway, and uh, we'll go all the way to 7.30 Sunday morning. Um, it's just a fabulous lineup. Uh, this postcard, Terry has... Oh, they're over here, right. The stack of postcards on the table over there, this postcard has all the details you need, uh, dozens of the best teachers in Center City, and all of the synagogues and other... Uh, Jewish organizations participating. So I, I hope that many of you will join us there. What I always tell everyone about Shavuot is you don't have to go all night. Stay an hour longer than you thought you would. For some of you, that means coming in the first place. And uh, with that, I want to just, again, uh, thank, you. You, thank you, Ruth, thank you, Harvey, and invite everyone to join us upstairs for a dessert reception. Thank you, Harvey. You're, you're